Please notice with me as we turn to Romans chapter 12 this morning. We're reading the first two verses. And I'm titling the message this morning, Nonconformity. And basically we have two points that we're going to be looking at today. We're going to, the first point is going to be, be not conformed to this world. And the second point is, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we're using the actual scripture for the outline. I hope that you have been excited about this passage as I have. I mentioned to you last week we would be in this text, and I'm not going to ask how many has been looking at it. I don't want to be disappointed. Maybe I wouldn't be disappointed. Let me go ahead. No, no, I won't ask. Notice with me as we read verse 1 and in verse 2. In verse 1 and in verse 2. We find here in God's Word, He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Heavenly Father, we do come before Thee again this morning, and Lord, we ask that You would teach us, we ask that we would be led by Thy Word and by Thy Holy Spirit, and I pray, Lord, that uh, You would help me, that we would only speak the truth, and Lord, help us to really meditate upon these scriptures as we've just sang in Psalms chapter 1. Lord, that we would delight in your word, that we would meditate upon it, that we would believe it, and Lord, that we would hunger and thirst for it. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen, and you may be seated. My prayers this morning is that we would hunger and thirst for the things of God as in Psalms 119.97, the psalmist, he said, Oh, how love I thy law, it is my meditation all the day. And so I pray this morning that we would have a desire to really look into this text. And we have studied this in the past. We have studied some of these things. Even we've, maybe not an entire sermon, but we've looked at some of these things throughout this summer. It seems like they've been certain texts that I've been drawn back to several times because of Zephaniah study or Galatians. But uh, notice here as we come back, and I'm going to be reading in verse 1 again. I'm going to read verse 1 and use it just as an introduction. And our text that we'll be taken from will actually be in verse 2, or two points from that. In 2012, I preached a message titled Non-Resistance. Now, what do we mean by that? We mean that the Christian is nonviolent. The Christian uh, walks in peace in opposition to uh, fighting or being a warmonger. Well, what do we mean when we use the word nonconformity? We mean that the Christian walks contrary to the world's dictates, standards, and belief system. Now, that's my definition of nonconformity. And you'll notice as we come to verse 1, let me read it again and make a few comments on this. We find here in verse 1, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, as I have meditated upon this this week, it's been a blessing to me. It's convicting, of course. Uh, we went through the book of Romans about ten years ago. I have a sermon titled Living Sacrifice 2010, and I have a sermon uh, 2006 titled Worldliness. So it's, this is nothing new to us, but I just wanted to come here and camp out in these two verses this morning and spend some time here. Now notice in verse 1, he begins with the words, I beseech you therefore. In other words, he's referring back to previous things he said when he uses the word therefore. The apostle is speaking to those who have received the mercies of God, which summarizes God's great salvation. 
He said, I beseech you, I beg you, I plead with you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. The mercies of God is the salvation that's revealed to us in the first 11 chapters of this book. We're stepping into the practical applications now in Romans chapter 12. And notice he said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Notice that he said that you present your bodies. God wants the whole person. The action, this is the action of bringing and presenting an offering to God at an altar. Be like the same thing as someone bringing a, a, a sacrifice to the altar. In other words, to devote that to the Lord or dedicate it. It is the yielding of our bodies. You don't have to turn there, but in Romans 6, 11, 12, and 13, it says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. God is not only concerned about our soul and our spirit, but God is concerned about our bodies. So he says here in verse 1, he says, Present, again, that's like bringing something before the Lord as an offering, yielding our members. He said, Present your bodies, notice, as a living sacrifice. As a living sacrifice. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2, he says, Walk in love as Christ has also loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. So we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. That is a life poured out upon the altar of Christian service. Now, I want you to think about this, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. That's our tongue, our eyes, our ears, our hands, our feet, etc. In other words, we are to present our bodies, the temple of the Holy Ghost. We're to present them as a living sacrifice. We are to yield our bodies unto God, as well as our hearts and our minds. The body has been an instrument of sin. In the past, our bodies has been an instrument of sin. But now that we're saved and born again, it is to become the channel through which the righteousness of God is manifest. Our body is, at one time was a vehicle or a channel for sin. Now it is to be for righteousness. And so he says that we're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. The word living denotes action and the word sacrifice denotes an offering. We're to offer it up unto God. Notice he goes on to say, holy. In other words, that means to be set apart. Uh, as in 1 Peter 1.16, God said, be ye holy for I am holy. And then he says acceptable. Acceptable, that means it would be well-pleasing unto God, would be a sweet aroma unto God. And then he says, in the latter part of verse 1, he says, which is your reasonable service. In other words, that which is illogical, that which is appropriate. God has never, ever asked of any of his people, his covenant people, anything that would be unreasonable. So, when we look at this, we find, as we look in verse 1, yielding our bodies unto the Lord. What does this look like? What does this mean? Well, notice with me now as we go to verse 2 and we see that. How is this done? Well, two ways. He says here in verse 2, and this is the verse we want to camp out in here this morning. And he says, and be not conformed to this world. There's one way. And then he says, but be ye transformed. Here's another way. 
but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's where it all starts, is in the mind. He says that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We want to talk about what is the will of God also this morning. But first of all, let's consider the statement, and this is my first uh, outline here, be not conformed to this world. Let's spend some time, a lot of time, on this, and then we will come back and we will consider what it means to be transformed. Now, there's two words in this first point that I want to place emphasis on. One is the word conformed, and the other one is the word world. Already twice this summer, since about April or May, uh, we have gone off on a couple of subjects, uh, and I've spent maybe five, ten minutes at a time on the world or covetousness or things of that nature. Pride, we were looking at pride just a little bit Sunday, Wednesday night uh, in the study in, our, in Zephaniah with Moab and, and Ammon. But notice now, he says here, and be not conformed to this world. Let's take the word conformed first of all. Now, what we're reading is an apostolic command of God. This is God speaking to us through the apostle. And here's something that we need desperately today. I'm talking about myself and you as a congregation. We're not preaching to those out there this morning. We're not preaching about any of those, but we're preaching to us, me and you. And we desperately, in 2019, need discernment. We need discernment. How can you under, how can you not be conformed to the world if you don't even know what the world is? I mean, the world could be described in three different ways. We know that according to John 1, 3, that there is this physical world. The birds, the trees, the plants, the sky, the stars. As in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 and, and, and following. Well, we also know there is the world of humanity or the world of mankind in John 3.16. For God so loved the world. He's talking about humanity. But there is also in the scripture as in John 8.44 and Matthew 12.26, the, the fallen world... The world of sin. So, what does it mean to be, to not be conformed to this world? I'm going to take the word conformed and the word world. Because again, we must know what the world is. If we don't know what the world is, and I'm going to tell you, most Christians in America do not know. If we have no idea what it means here, then how in the world can we not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So there, so I, I would suggest to you, as a Christian, to spend a month, if you have to get a concordance, just spend a month studying this subject of the world. And I'm not talking about the created world. I'm talking about the world of sin uh, that that evil organized system that's headed by Satan, which is in rebellion against God. That's, that's the definition of, of the world in this text that we're reading right now. He's not talking about the plants and the birds and the trees and the stars, but he's talking about the world of sin. Uh, that, that evil organization or organized system that is headed by Satan that is in rebellion against God. This is what he's talking about. And when we talk about the world, we're talking about its beliefs, its values, its morals, its philosophies, ideologies. We're talking about its attitudes. We're talking about its entertainments, its ambitions, and its passions and pursuits. That's what this text means. Now, you can read in other places where the world, again, might refer to just all humanity who need to be saved, or it might refer to the heavens and the earth and so forth. But in the text we're going to be reading, 
this we're going to use it in the sense of the fallen world, the world of sin that's in rebellion against God that Satan is leading. Now, notice he uses the word conformed. I think we understand this word. It means, it has the ideal of to be fashioned or shaped or molded. In other words, as one author put it, to settle in a mold as molten metal or wet concrete is poured in the mold or form, when hardened it takes on a permanent form. In other words, when you take wet concrete, you build a form and you pour, let's say you're going to pour a sidewalk out of concrete, you build a form and you take wet concrete and pour it in it and when it is hardened, it takes the, takes shape of those forms. As a matter of fact, the vehicles you drove here in this morning at one time were liquid, either metal or plastic. And they were poured into forms. I mean, half your car is plastic now, right? And, and so they, it's either metal or plastic. They were poured into forms and, and it took on a permanent form. That's the ideal of this word here. And it, it means to change the image of something. To be conformed. To change the image of something. Philippians 3.21, we'll probably read this later. But this verse says, Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? Now, we probably go there and read that later because my second point this morning is going to be associated with that. So you have the word changed and, or change and the word fashioned in that verse. And that's the ideal that we see here in this text. Now, let's come back to the word world. We, we know what it means to be conformed. All right? It's to be shaped or fashioned or to put into a mold. And we don't want to take on the world's beliefs and values and morals. As I was talking to Brother Ernie this morning, we were ta- I told him what I was preaching, was talking about it, and I said everything nearly I believed before I got saved was wrong. Now, I had, I had good worth ethics just because of the way we were raised up and whatever. But I mean, most of what I believed was wrong and contrary to the Word of God. So it's been a process of changing over these years. Yes, even since I have been preaching. So when we talk about the world, we're talking about the spirit of the age. We're talking about which is led by Satan. It is the world of sin and disobedience. So he says in verse 2, he said, And be not conformed to this world. Now we're going to see in a few moments, this all begins in the mind and heart. Now notice with me as we turn to Ephesians 2. Now some of these passages are going to be very familiar to you, but please look at them and ask God to open our eyes to the truth here. Um, Repetition is not bad in many cases. And we've had a little repetition this summer. I mean, we've got off on a few subjects, and and some of it's because we've come to it in a verse-by-verse setting, and some of it is because I felt like the Lord has led me to teach on this. But notice now in Ephesians 2, very familiar passage, but let me read the first three verses. And I want you to notice here we were talking about the world. Okay, the world. He says here, as we come to this text, he said, beginning in verse 1, And you hath he quickened, that is, made alive, born again, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, every individual is is either dead in sins, or in Romans 6, dead to sin. They're either lost or saved, one or the other. Now, he's talking about before we were born again. He says that we were dead in sins, trespasses and sins. That is, we were not alive unto God. That is, we could not think biblically or scripturally. Now watch this. He said in verse 2, He says, For in time past, before you got saved, you walked according to the course of this world. 
Notice that. Walking according to the spirit of the age. The course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now, it didn't matter whether he was raised in church or raised out of church as I was. If you, Before you got saved, you fit into this category. You may not have been a drunk or a pervert or a, a drug addict, but still yet every person fitted into this category. We were dead to the things of God. We were dead in trespasses and sins, and we walked according to the course of this world. Notice, according to the prince of the power of the air, uh, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So there is a spirit of the age that works in all who are lost. It doesn't matter whether in Sunday school or in the bar on Sunday morning. There is a spirit that it, that is working within them that they're walking a course that is contrary to the straight and narrow path. I mean, that's just a fact. doesn't matter how good anybody thinks they are. Uh, it, they're, they're walking according to this course. Now, notice as we come to verse 3. In verse 3, I want you to notice, and by the way, when he said, the Spirit that now worketh, in verse 2, the Spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedient. In other words, not only is this Spirit working in them, they're empowered, listen, they're empowered by Satan. Every lost person is empowered by Satan. And they do not have the Spirit of God in them. And this is why they can't think biblically. And this is why they push and tug against the truth and the things of the Word of God and resist it. We were all there. I was there until I was 19 years of age. And we find now in verse 3, you'll notice he said, among whom also we all had our conversation. We all had our conversation. In other words, no one is excluded. He begins in verse 4 talking about being saved. But he says in verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Notice our conversation in time past was in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. In other words, we were doing what we wanted to do. You may not have been a drunk, you may not have been a drug addict, but still yet you're doing your own thing, walking your own course. So this this sums up where we're at, and I'm not going to read it right now, maybe later, but in chapter 4, uh, verses uh, 17 through 19, says that we were alienated from the life of God. We had no spiritual life before that we're saved. This is why we must be regenerated, and this is why we must be born again. Turn with me, please, to Galatians chapter 1. And if you're taking notes, we're talking about now the world, the sinful world. In Titus chapter 2, verse 12, it says that the grace of God the grace of God that saved us, the grace of God teaches us to deny worldly lust. We're talking about the world now. For every verse I turn to, we're going to find the word world, the sinful world that we live in. Now notice in Galatians 1, we find in verse 1, 2, and 3, Christ dying for our... Well, the introduction, verse 1, 2, and 3, verse 4 Christ dying, verse 4, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us, notice this, from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Notice carefully that he mentions the fact of this present evil world. This world is evil. Not talking about the trees and plants and flowers, but this world is evil and it is led by Satan himself. It is led by the devil. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. You should have these verses already marked in your Bible. And notice with me in 1 John chapter 2. Now, I not only preach this to you, I preach this to myself. I go back and remind myself of these things. 
uh, over and over I do this so that I don't lose sight of the Scripture. Now notice in 1 John chapter 2, and I'm going to be reading uh, in, in this passage from verses 15 through 17. Some of you may even be able to quote this. But notice as we come here to this text and read this. We learn each one of these verses are telling us something a little more about what the world is, the characteristics of this sinful world. He said in verse 15, he said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, I don't know about you, but those are some sobering words to me. They are sobering words to see what God has said here in this passage. I want you to notice that he said, first of all, love not the world. Now, again, I've got to know what the world is. And I need to study this. I need to look at it. I need to know what the world is. And so, he said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. In other words, if we love the world, he says clearly that the love of the Father is not in us. What does that mean? That means we're not saved. Now, that's sobering. And what we have here in this text, especially in verse 16, is a description of what the world is. Somebody say, what is the world? Well, right here it is. You put this together with other verses and you can get a pretty clear understanding of what God says that the world is. Notice with me as we read verse 15 again. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now notice the world's trinity in verse 16. We find here there are three things that make up the world. We find here the sinful world is summed up in three different areas of sin and temptation. There are three classes of sin and temptation here in this passage. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now again, I beg of you to take you a notebook and sit down with it. If you have to get a concordance or a Bible dictionary, whatever that you need, and really spend some time on this. Now, the first area of temptation is in verse 16, and it is the lust of the flesh. The word flesh is used in a large sense, not always, but in a large sense, as the whole of the corrupt nature which we inherited from Adam. And it has to do with the sensual appetites of a sinful nature. Give you an example. If you will write down, we'll be in these studies in a few weeks, in Galatians, Galatians 5, verses 19, 21, we find that the lust of the flesh includes social and sexual sins. We find in Mark chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, sensual appetites. Again, he gives us a definition of a heart there. And then in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Abstain from fleshy lust which war against the soul. These things war against the soul. In other words, the lust of the flesh is this constant thing that we see in America today that was in the Roman Empire in the first century. This constant pleasure-seeking, having fun. And I'm not in get against enjoying yourself. But this constant pleasure-seeking, that's what we're talking about here in this passage. The lust of the flesh. It includes social and sexual sins. Now let's come to the lust of the eyes. 
And by the way, if you'll write down one word for a definition of lust of the flesh, write down the word pleasure. If you want to write down one word for the lust of the eyes, write down profit. P-R-O-F-I-T. We're talking about, in verse 16, the, the lust of the eyes. These are the things that we behold. The things that we see and long for and can be summed up in one word, and we've already talked about this subject twice since about April, but it can be summed up in one word, maybe two, that is covetousness and materialism. We are eat up with this in this country. Let me go through a list of verses without turning to them because we want to hang out here in this passage a little bit longer. But listen to this. I gave you a similar list probably a month or two months ago. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11. The covetous man, God says, don't even keep company with him and eat with him if he calls himself a brother. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9, 10, 11, the covetous man shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In Colossians 3, 5, covetousness is idolatry, as in Ephesians 5, verse 7 through, verse 5 through 7, I think. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about the things that keep people from God. And it is things, most of the time, that keeps us from God, or when we get saved, they keep us from serving God. In Exodus 20, 17, the tenth commandment, has to do with covetousness. In Luke chapter 12, verse 13, the sin of covetousness, take heed, beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. We don't understand that in America anymore. We gauge people's success on worldly standards. The heroes today are the Donald Trumps, the Bill Gates, and the Steve Jobs. That's the heroes in our country today. Those who know how uh, to make the money and flaunt it. We find that in Genesis 19.26, Lot's wife fell to this. We find that Achan in Joshua 21 fell to this and lost his family. And we find that David fell to covetousness in 2 Samuel 11 verse 2 when he took another man's wife. So, so this is a, this is a real issue and a real sin. And this is why that we find in Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. This is why 1 Timothy 6, 8 says, having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. This is why 1 Timothy 6, 10 says, the love of money, some who have coveted after it, it has destroyed their faith. Now these are sobering verses. These are sobering verses when it tells me that you cannot serve God and mammon, which is riches in uh, Matthew chapter 6. And so we find here clearly that God gives serious warning to these things because they will keep the lost from getting saved, and they will keep us as Christians from being fruitful in our Christian life. Covetousness. Notice as we come back here to verse uh, 16. Verse 16. I usually don't do much shopping unless I need anything. I usually don't go online and just look and look unless I need something. You know, I I was telling somebody the other day, the... Um, I said, uh, not been 12 times this year, but once a month as I'm going to preach uh, at one of the missions. By the way, we'll be in Mission of Hope tomorrow night. But one of the missions I go preaching, if I have the time, I, it was my wife I was telling this. I stop, I stop in there for 15 minutes or so and walk through it, uh, field and stream, and uh, I've spent $3 in there in a year. Big spender, man. I usually, if I don't need anything, I'm usually not doing much shopping. And we've got to be careful of that. 
because we don't want to create covetousness in our heart. I mean, it's already there to begin with. We have to deal with it, but we surely don't want to enhance it. Notice the next thing that is in, that is in our text here. He says here in verse 16, the next thing is the pride of life. The pride of life. You can write down beside that position. Position. What did I give you? Pleasure, one profit for the other, and position. In other words, it is the sin of the mind. And it's self-congratulations of having arrived. It's called the pride of life because its, it's stain affects every part of our individual life. Pride, I mentioned, I was on this a little bit uh, Wednesday night. Pride was the first sin in the universe and it's the worst sin that has ever been committed. It is the most heinous of all of the sins that are mentioned here in this text. And I want to give you a quote. I've given this many times over the years, but I want to give you a quote. And, and it says, sensuality is corruption of the lower part of man's being that sinks him to the level of beast, but pride is the corruption of the highest part of his nature, lifting his understanding and spirit against God and enters into fellowship with the devil. And the text given is 1 Timothy 3, 6 and Isaiah 14, verse 12 through 14, where Satan said, I would be lifted up above God. What is pride? It's self-idolatry. Matthew 6, again, it is verse 1 and 2, it's living for the applause of men as the Pharisees did. In 2 Timothy 3, 2, it talks about boasters, proud, blasphemers, covetous. Pride is the root and, and, and source of all other sins. Everything else would fit under this category. It keeps sinners from salvation and it keeps saints from serving God. And we read a passage Wednesday night in Proverbs 6, verse 16 through 19. And there's six things the Lord hates, yea, seven an abomination. And the very first one, top of the list, the most deadliest, is the subject of pride. So, So this is a serious issue. And notice he said in verse 16... He said, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Verse 17, and the world passes away. In other words, it is doomed and it is temporal. And he says here in this passage, it passes away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That's a great promise to you and I. It's a promise for us to stay on that straight and narrow path. God has made many, many promises. Notice in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. And while you're turning there, you can write these verses down. John 12, verse 31. Satan is the prince of this world. Said that in several places in John. 2 Corinthians 4, and verse 4. He's the God of this world. 1 Corinthians 2.20 speaks of the wisdom of this world. Mark chapter 8, verse 36, you, you can gain the whole world and lose your soul in hell. And Luke 8, verse 14 speaks of the cares of this world. And when the Lord Jesus in the book of John, chapter 17, when He prayed for His disciples, verse 13 through 16, He prayed of the fact, He said, they're not of this world. They're in this world. Now, he uses the world in two or three different ways there. But he said they're in the world, but they're not of the world. He said the world hates them because they're not a part of that system. And he repeats that again in John 15, verses 18 and 19. So, the the Lord was very clear. The Lord said that His disciples, the believer, they were in the world geographically, but they were not in the world spiritually. And that's the way we are. We're in this world geographically. We have to eat. We have to live. We have to work our jobs. We have to the the things that we've got to do in this world. And still yet, spiritually speaking, we're not a part of this world. We should never conform to this world's ideologies and philosophies and beliefs and their values 
We should never conform to that. That's what God is telling us to do. Now notice, as we read in chapter 3, in verse 1, I want you to notice the sons of God are not of this world. He said in verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Again, he's talking about that sinful, organized system that is evil and led by Satan. Notice in chapter 4, 1 John, in chapter 4, I'm reading uh, in verse 4 and 5, and he says here, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Of course, we hear God in verse 6, because we're not of the world. Turn with me please to chapter 5 in 1 John. Chapter 5, reading verse 4 and 5, and in verse 19. You're taking notes this morning. James 4 and verse 4 clearly tells us that the world is at enmity with God. He says you cannot be a friend of the world and be a friend of God. Now that, I mean, that, that is an amazing passage. And he says, you adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's sobering. That is sobering. He says here in 1 John chapter 5, reading in verse 4 and 5. Notice here. He says, For whosoever is born again. See, we keep coming back to that. We keep coming back to that. Whosoever is born again overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. And what is this world again? Verse 19. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. See, that's that sinful world that is led by Satan, the spirit of the age. Well, turn with me please to the, back to the book of Romans now. Back to the book of Romans. Another passage you might want to jot down would be John, I'm not, not John, but James 1.27. He tells us to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Well, notice back in Romans chapter 12. So we see the negative. Now let's look at the positive. First of all, he says in verse 2, he said, And be not conformed to this world. If I can understand what the word conformed means, and I can understand what the world means, then maybe I can get this thing together. But notice now, as he comes to the rest of this verse, he said, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I don't know of any other verses that has so much practical truth in them besides these two here. Now notice, let's talk now about being transformed by the renewing of our mind. This all begins with our thinking. It all begins in our heart and mind. In other words, a radical transformation of thinking. When we talk about the world, I think about my grandparents, my great-grandparents, how they were in the world, they had to deal with the world, but how much of it did they have to deal with? I mean, back then, if you wanted something worldly, you know, especially if it comes to music or entertainment or whatever, you had to go, you, you had to walk somewhere or ride a donkey you know, many hundred years or so ago. But you know what? We carry the world around with us in our pocket now. We can have access to anything we want with what we carry in our pocket today with a smartphone. Think about the difference now 
and especially a hundred years ago. I mean, they had to deal with sin. They had to deal with temptations. But think about the difference now, the access that we have. We have access to good things. We also have access to very bad things. What does it mean to be transformed? And by the way, let me, let me mention a few things. I am not going to use any quotes this morning, but I want to give you a few other verses here just real quickly. Uh, some, some examples. When we talk about being not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, that is just, let me give you a one word definition of transform, and it just simply means to be changed. To take on another form. Our English word metamorphosis comes from a Greek word that's spelled almost the same way. It's M-E-T-A-M-O-R-P-H-O-O. And it is translated, transformed here in Romans 12, 2. Also, the, it's, it, the same root word is used in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, where it says, it says, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even by, as by the Spirit of the Lord. That word changed has the same root in the Greek. And so we see here in this passage that we are changed. When we look into... Um, the Word of God. He says, beholding as in a glass, looking into the Word of God, we see the glory of the Lord and we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, from one degree to the next. This is a daily process. As we look into the things of God and we behold the Savior, we're changed from one degree to the next. But this is also the same word, or I shouldn't say the same Greek word, but the same root that is translated transfigured in Matthew 17 and verse 2, where it says, His face did shine as, a, as the sun, and His raiment was white as the light. Christ was transformed before three of the disciples, and Peter writes about it in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 16, and he said, we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. So we're talking about the same concept. The word transformed has the idea of being changed or transfigured. In the fall, the caterpillar builds a cocoon. In the winter, it undergoes metamorphosis. In the spring, it brings breaks forth rather into a butterfly. And you could study uh, the subject of tadpoles and, 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 and see the same thing. But the point is, this change process is from the inside out. It's got to begin in here. It's got to begin in here with the Spirit of God, with a new birth, with regeneration. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. It's got to begin right in here. Now, let's think about this for a moment. Let's think about worship. In John 4, 22 through 20, or 23 and 24, I should say, we must worship God in spirit and truth. The Spirit of God and the Word of God determines our worship. We can't just worship anyway. Cain learned that lesson. There is a thing as will worship in Colossians 2. There's two men that offered strange fire in the book of Leviticus, and they and their families died. We must learn to worship. Now, when it comes to music, we find in the Scripture in Ephesians 5, 19, and Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, that we're to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Our music is to be pure. It's to be God-honoring. Our music is to be sacred. That's the opposite of secular. The Christian has a new song, according to Psalms 33.3 and Revelation 5.9. God's songs are different than the world in every way, in words and style and rhythm and everything. 
God's songs edify, build up, they teach, they encourage, they strengthen us, uh, they strengthen our faith, they challenge us, and they also bring comfort to us. There's the positive. But when we look into the realm of secular music, it doesn't matter what style that it is. When you look at music, I've shown you years ago that the test of any music is three things. You look at the musician or the composer, and you look at their belief system and their lifestyle. And you look at the message, which is the content, that is the words, the lyrics, the teachings, the preaching, the doctrine, and yes, all songs preach and teach, and they have doctrine. And the third thing is you look at the music itself or the composition. That is, uh, you look at the words, the melody, the rhythm, the arrangement, and all of that. That's the best test knowing whether music is good or bad. You take any type of secular music, it doesn't matter what it is. We hear about easy rock and soft rock. Rock is rock. Rock is rock. And we are told to prove all things and hold fast to that which is good in 1 Thessalonians 5.21. And the, the rock and roll world is filled with sodomites and perverts, and it is filled with immoral people. I mean, Elton John, Freddie Mercury of Queen that died in his 40s from AIDS, these were filthy, vile people. Elvis Presley between uh, gospel music and country music and rock and roll music. He died full of drugs with an occult book in his hand. We find that uh, country music is wicked and sinful and corrupt, and what's bad about it, you can actually understand the words. And the Bible speaks of the song of the drunkard in Psalm 69 and verse 12. Today there's a mixture blending together of country and rock. It's kind of it's kind of pulled together. When I was growing up, the only religious experience that we had in our home was hee haw once a week, an hour every week. And but you know what was so we thought was so fantastic you'd have all these secular stupid garbage and everything and at the end of it they'd all get together Buck Owens and all of them get together and they would sing a hymn so that made it okay that made it okay CCM music is a mixture uh, of uh, you, you've got a mixture of rock and roll and country music with Jesus put to it right down Ezekiel 22. Verse 26, they imitate the rock and rollers. They are mixing together the profane and the holy. All the secular is wicked. It's wicked. Some of us say, what about the classical music? We've got two sermons on classical music. One on Beethoven. Beethoven, his ninth symphony, his last ode to joy, was to honor the pagan goddess of liberty worshipped by high-level masons. He was a wretched man, immoral, and his music was his God. So a lot of the classical music is wicked as hell too. It's just as bad as the rock and roll in the country and all the other uh, types of music. Tchaikovsky, he was a sodomite. His brother was a sodomite. And people say, oh, just, I just love this music. I, I've read some things from... Uh, uh, an album on one of these, uh, is either Beethoven or Tchaikovsky, and they admitted in the album cover that he was vile. But they says his talent and the art overrode all of that, and we love his music. Well, they have not been transformed in the renewing of their mind. Now, let me give you two real quickly. I don't take up much time with this, and I'm not going to give you some of the quotes I've got. But let me give you two. Um, one many years ago in country music, and one today that's kind of a mixture between country and rock. Hank Williams Sr. from Alabama, and Junior, and then there's a third, and all of them were wicked. But Christians back then and today think that Hank Williams Sr. was just the greatest guy. Now before I even tell you anything about him, let me tell you that the Bible said in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 that the drunkard shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's clear. That's very clear. Well, he died at 29 years of age, January the 1st, 1953. 
And my dad was a big follower of his music. I heard all of his songs growing up all the time. He was the first one inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame and is also, I believe, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He was a superstar of his day, especially as Evelis came along later and became very famous. He was raised in church. He sang gospel hymns. That's how he started. And then he began singing country music and then he began mixing them all together. On the same stage, sing about drinking and fornicating and fighting and cursing and blasphemy, and then end the show with a hymn. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I came out of that garbage. I was raised in it. And I'm telling you, this stuff is no good. His songs were about divorce, drinking, fornication, adultery. Here's some of the titles. Tears, Tears, and a Tear in My Beer. Rambling man means he wouldn't stay married. He went from woman to woman. Honky tonking. And I'm a long gone daddy. In other words, he's saying, I'm not staying home. I'm a rambling man. He was a drunk. He was a fornicator. He was an adulterer. He was a fighter. He was a blasphemer. And he was fired from the Grand Ole Opry for his drunkenness. But you know what? When his funeral was done, January the 4th, 1953, he was preached into heaven. And there's about 25,000 people attended his funeral, probably more than some presidents, you know, that have, that have died. And he died in the back seat of a brand new Cadillac on alcohol, morphine, and other pain killers. In other words, he died going to a concert in Ohio at 29 years of age. Country music was bad then, and it is bad today. And But what they do in the country music, they love to mix together, used to, not as much now, a little bit of gospel so all the Christians will feel very, very good about it. And Hank Williams Sr. wrote the song, I Saw the Light. A drunk and an adulterer, a fornicator, wrote the song, I Saw the Light. And Christians argue with me to this day and say, oh, he was saved. He was born again, and he was going to heaven. Well, now that's between him and God, but you shall know them by their fruits. Taylor Swift. She's very famous. I had a 70-something-year-old individual tell me about three weeks ago, oh, she's a lovely young lady. I said, are you a Christian? This woman, this year alone, gave over $100,000 in February to the Sodomite community in Tennessee. One of her latest songs and videos is titled, Calm Down. It promotes sodomy and it slanders Christianity. And she is pushing the Senate at this time to say yes on a vote to LGBT Equality Act. I don't have to guess where she stands. Even before this, her music is wicked, sensual, immodest, shameful, worldly, and provocative. It doesn't matter what style of music, if it's secular, it's wrong. And even Southern Gospel and CCM is out of hell also. I don't care if they do put Jesus' name to it. It is wrong and it will not lead you to saving faith in Jesus Christ. So when we come to this subject and we talk, be not conformed to this world. Let us not be conformed to the beliefs and philosophies and the standards and whatever of this world. Let us not be, no matter what area of life. And, and I mentioned to you, we preached a month or so ago on the subject of attire and, a, and apparel. We have verses in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 14 through 16, speaks of modesty and how that we are to be in worship. It's dealing with the subject of worship. And 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10 speaks of clothing. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6 speaks of clothing. Clothes are to conceal and not to reveal. Lost men and women a hundred years ago knew more about modesty than Christians do today in the time in which we live. I said I wasn't going to quote. I brought one of my articles back into the pulpit that we wrote a number of years ago. 
There are three issues in the Bible when it comes to dress, and that's modesty, free from vanity, that's nakedness, covering the body, and number three is cross-dressing, distinction between the sexes. And Isaiah 47, 1 through 5 equates expo- exposing the thigh and leg as nakedness and shame, and the leg is connected with the foot. And again, when I go back and I read lost people, I put in this article, lost people who are making statements a hundred years ago, back in the 19 and 20s, they're making statements. Lost people are concerned how high that the hem of the dresses are going to come up. And I've given you these quotes several times before, but I'll give you just one or two, and I'm, I'm not quoting from anybody else. This is from my own article. And let me, let me find it here. And this was quoting now. Until the 1900s, women wore floor-length dresses that were not thin nor form-fitting. The Roaring Twenties began to bring a lot of change to our country. And go study the Roaring Twenties. I'm telling you, it wasn't transformation and biblical thinking. And said one of these changes was in dress. Even the unsaved saw this change. For example, a fashion writer for the New York Times, the American... Woman has lifted skirts far beyond any modest limitation. Another writer said, if dress hems are nine inches off the ground today, there could come a day when our nation becomes so immoral, hems will rise to the kneecap. These lost people a hundred years ago had more conviction than Christians do today. And I won't even get into the body piercing. In 2006, when I wrote an article on this, there were over 20 million people with tattoos and body piercing. Can you imagine what is it, what it is today? And I won't even get into sports this morning. This is all I hear now. It's all I hear everywhere you go. Flying their flags. They tell you what they believe and what they're following, and what their belief system is, you know, and all caught up in all this stupidity. Do you realize when you support these colleges, you're supporting a belief system that is taking young Christians' faith away from them if they go there? That's teaching evolution, teaching nudity. to, to, To follow any of these colleges is supporting the very things that you and I are standing for. To support Alabama, Auburn, LSU, Tennessee, any of these, you are supporting the very things that's destroying the faith of the young people in this country. Can I get an amen? All right, now let's get back to our text. Now notice this. We're talking about being transformed. By the renewing of your mind. There's several other things in this text here that's given to us. But this is the way that we change. It all begins in the mind and heart. It begins with regeneration. Titus 3.5 if you're taking notes. Renewing of the Holy Ghost to be made new. It's to be given a divine nature. 2 Peter 1.4 it's to become a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. In other words, it begins with regeneration and it continues as we grow in grace and walk in obedience to the Lord. As 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17 and 18, we, we change from one degree to the next of glory as we follow the Lord Jesus. And I think about a passage... I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. But I think about a passage in the book of James. In James chapter 1, we've already seen the word glass. But in James 1, the Bible tells us, he in verse chapter 1 verse 24, he that beholdeth himself, now let me, yes, no, verse 23. 
If any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. It's like looking in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, verse 24, and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Verse 25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now here's the thing. How do we dress ourselves physically or spiritually? Obviously, he uses in two passages the, the metaphor of a mirror. And when we look into a mirror, we, we're dressing ourselves, getting ourselves presentable. But what about dressing ourselves spiritually? Right here is the mirror. The only way that I can dress properly in the eyes of God and be presentable is that I must do it through the mirror of the Word of God. And I'm telling you, every time we step up to a physical, literal mirror and, and we are getting dressed and putting our clothes on, whatever, we ought to be thinking about how does God want me to present myself to those around me this day? I mean, that should, that should not be difficult. That should not be di- if, if If lost people a hundred years ago in many circumstances have more convictions than Christians do today, I mean, that's amazing. That's too much change and conformity in the wrong direction. Now, notice carefully as we come to the book of Ephesians. I'm reading from verse 20, verse 17 through 19. Again, he's describing the lost person. Their understanding is darkened. They're alienated from the life of God. But notice now, In verse 20, he said, But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus. Now, he's describing in our verses we're reading now a regenerate person. Verse 20 and 21, this is not the easiest uh when I, when I talk through the book of Ephesians, it almost looked a little confusing at first. But what he's saying, since you learned and been taught by Christ at salvation, that's your past experience, then live according to that. And then he says in verse 22 that we're to put off the old man. But notice as we come to verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which is which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness we are to be renewed notice where it starts in the spirit of your mind as a christian the new man is everything that we are in Jesus Christ by the new birth we're to put off the old and we're to put on the new But let me come back to this word learned in verse 20 and taught in verse 21. We need to be taught by the Lord. Not just knowing about Him, but knowing Him. As Mary of Bethany in Luke 10, 39, Martha's sister sat at the feet of Jesus and took in every word that he said. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30 he said, Learn of me, I am meek and lowly. We are to study him, not just about him, but to study him. We are to be taught by him. We are to have our eyes fixed upon him. Now this is so important. He's our example in the Scripture. So we are to be taught by the Lord. But where does all this begin? It begins with regeneration. It begins right here in the mind and the heart. Verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Notice, now, as we look in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10, I'll tell you what, go with me to Romans chapter 8. We'll skip over that. I'll just give that to you. 
Colossians 3.10. Go back with me to Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8 this time. And notice here. You're taking notes, Colossians 3.10. He said to putting on, he said, be renewed in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 9, changing the mind. Remember he said, think on these things in verse 8. And then he said we would be physically changed and conformed and fashioned unto Jesus one day. Notice with me as we come to Romans chapter 8, reading one verse. Romans 8, reading one verse. He says in verse 29, he said, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, notice to be conformed to the image of his Son, that it might be the firstborn among many brethren. Again, we are predestinated to be conformed spiritually and physically to the image of of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15.49 As we had borne the image of the earthy, we shall bear the image of the heavenly. And so we have the promise one day of having, having that total transformation. To be completely formed and fashioned to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that begins at the new birth. That begins at the view. And it's from the inside out. It's from the inside out. Now go back with me to chapter 12 and notice one more time. Verse 2. By the way, we have many resources to help us in this. One of the resources we have is the anointing. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 and verse 27. The Holy Spirit lives inside of the believer. We're going to be talking about the Spirit a lot in the remainder of Galatians 5 on Sunday nights. So we have the anointing. We also have the Word of God. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. We also have prayer, James chapter 1 and verse 5. And we also have the church and we have pastors and teachers as in Ephesians 4, 11 through 15 to help us and to teach us these things. So we have many resources. But notice he said now, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. It all starts right there. And then he said that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This should be our heart's desire. Our goal is to know God's will and to live in it. There's... There is peace and joy in the center of God's will. And God says that we can know it. He tells us that we can know His will. Have you ever seen anybody 70, 80 years of age and God spared their life? Well, I don't know why I'm here. And if you ain't figured out why you're here and you're 80 years of age, you need to get saved. You know. and God has left us all here for a, pers- for a purpose. Well, let's close in Proverbs chapter 3 with the will of God. i got many more things I could say, but I've probably said enough. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 and 7. We'll close here. It is no small matter when we talk about God's will and not being conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind to know His purpose and plan. This is no small matter. We live in a world with many voices and views and opinions that solicit our attention in in this troubled world. So we need to know His will. Here we are in Proverbs chapter 3, reading in verse 5 through 7. If you're taking notes, Psalms 25, 9 said, The meek He will guide in judgment, and the meek will He teach His way. Uh, Psalms 23, 2, God leads His people. We can know His will. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, 
and He shall direct thy path. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. God has promised in verse 6 that He will direct our path if we will trust in Him and lean not unto our own understanding. I beg of you this morning to study this subject. To study it. Take the word conform. The word transform. Take the word world. And spend about a month and put your notebook together and study this. It is so important in the Christian life. Would you stand with me please? Father, we thank You this morning for Your Word, for Your love, for Your mercy and grace to us. Lord, we thank You for all the mercies of God. We thank You for saving us. And Lord, we pray this morning that You would help us to understand what this world is all about. This sinful world we live in that is in opposition against You. And Lord, that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds Father, I pray that we all would have hearts for You, seeking You. And Lord, every decision, thoughts, views that we hold, attitudes that we have that would all be based upon the principle of a transformed mind. Father, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.